affects the physicians. And so we do run into each other every day. And even if you don't like somebody, you're going to see them anyway. And uh, because if you fragment even the way you set up healthcare, then walls get built up very, very quickly between disciplines. So we, uh, you know, I, I tell I tell my staff that a lot of my job as a director is to kick down. Every time I see two bricks getting put up between disciplines, I go over and kick them down because we have to have open lines of communication. We depend on each other's expertise, and then so it fosters a culture of shared responsibility, openness, and teamwork. And that's something that is lacking in general in the healthcare system. Now we do have good teams here and there. But the system as a whole is so fragmented that nobody gets the sense of teamwork. Uh, and we don't even, we think in terms of going to this specialist and that specialist. Uh, but uh, we're still a long way from just basic sharing of information. Well, what did that specialist say? And then you try to find out from the family member what was said, or uh, you jump through hoops to get the, the, a summary from that particular specialist, etc. So when you have a system that's built up where you communicate in real time, it's much more efficient and you can come up with real solutions to real problems next. When studies have looked at interdisciplinary care and they show that you have improved survival, you have better quality of life, patients uh, uh, report that they have uh, a better sense of well-being, less anxiety, there's a higher quality of care, better outcome scores, really at every level that you care to look for, you can look at blood pressure control or um, uh, depression, I mean any parameter you want to look at, the outcome scores are generally better. Higher patient satisfaction, lower total cost, fewer hospital admissions, mm -hmm. physician office visits, emergency room visits, and fewer x-rays and other laboratory studies. So what's not to love? The bottom line is, is that the studies are out there, the information is out there, these systems do work and they address all of the issues that uh, we face, whether we're talking about cancer or any other health care issue, or even family, uh, dysfunctional families. And the dysfunction of families, the impact of domestic violence or child abuse, sexual abuse, uh, the impact of alcoholism on families is, uh, is, is, is staggering. But if you can approach those things in an interdisciplinary way, and we've actually started to, to take on some of the young alcoholic, generally males, a few females that that get admitted to the ICU at Fort Defiance. I was kind of reluctant at first to do it, but you know, when you look at the statistics that our males are dying at age 56, and the rest of the United States at 76, that's two decades less, it's just not okay. So we actually have started to enroll some of the, um, mostly males, as I said, that have gotten themselves into a lot of trouble with alcohol. And uh, I've been surprised how well we do so far. We've kept most of them out of the hospital, and. and you know, I, it, it, we'll, we'll continue to do what we're doing. I mean, it's too early to be able to show statistics that we're impacting that overall age of death, but I think the people that we have taken under our wing and they get visits by the, the nurse and a mental health worker and a social worker, uh, we also work with the families, that it is making a difference. And, uh, and if you look at the, the records of those individuals, they're not being admitted to the intensive care unit or even to the hospital, and, and many of them are doing actually quite well. Next. So the model that we used uh, at Fort Defiance, uh, and I, I was exposed to these models when I did a fellowship in geriatrics a few years back in Albuquerque, uh, are two, well three models, but uh, two that are well established in the United States, but many people are not necessarily aware of them. They're, they're funded by Medicare. Um, and the first one is the Medicare Hospice Benefit, which has been around since 1982. And by uh, design, this is an interdisciplinary program. Uh, now this is designed for people who are facing end of life, and, but the Medicare Benefit, in order to pay a hospice company, they have to have this team here. It's, it's in the legislation. And they have to have an interdisciplinary approach to that health care, and it's very, uh, to that care, and it's very effective. And you'll see that uh, we have, it's not so much the doctors, uh, there has to be a medical director, but the majority of the health care that's for the services that are provided are non-medical. They're provided by nurses, social workers, home health aides, bereavement services are specifically written into that legislation and, and spiritual.
spiritual services because it's recognized how the, the impact that any serious life-threatening disease has on the patient and the family. I mean, it does focus your attention. You realize that you're mortal and you are going to die. You know, one of the things that um, I say, you know, people say, well, there's death and taxes. Well, a lot of people don't pay taxes, but everybody dies. So the fact is that it is a fact of life. Death is a fact of life. So we don't have any control over whether or not we're going to die. We do have some control on how we're going to live. And I think that that's where we refocus things. Well, patient might say, well, I, I, you know, I'm gonna die. Well, yes, that's a given. We're all gonna die. How do you want to live? And I think that it, it refocuses how we address that patient. You know, we're not gonna focus on the fact that they're going to die, we're gonna focus on how they're living. And it makes a big difference. It actually refocuses how the patient sees themselves, too. Next. Uh, the other program, I, I must have uh, left it off the slide, is what's called PACE, which is Program for All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. And this is a Medicare-funded program that was started also in the 80s. And it takes elders who are at risk for being placed in nursing homes and it keeps them in the home by having an interdisciplinary team take care of that individual. Again, it's run by social workers, physical therapy, uh, physicians, nurses, and the needs of that elder are addressed in a way that the family gets support. There are caregivers that are put into the home. The caregiver could be a family member that's getting paid. There's elder daycare involved. There's nutritional services. And by addressing all of these different needs for the elders, where they live, you can keep them out of a nursing home. So we really use these two programs, which are interdisciplinary by law, and adapted them to what we're doing. So in 1999, we started the Elder Care Task Force at Fort Defiance, and this really was uh, started out of necessity. I mean, we had elders that were just being readmitted to the hospital, uh, and obviously, um, uh, failing at home. I mean, they just didn't have the services. So we got everybody together that was involved in elder care services. And we didn't care if they were tribal, BIA, uh, IHS. We met all together uh, in one room and we said, in this room there are no walls. It's not BIA, it's not a Navajo Nation, it's not IHS. We are going to do case management. And we started looking at some of these uh, patients. and. Uh, the more we work together, the more we all realize that there are a lot of services out there, but there are just people didn't know what services were available. And the people who were providing the services weren't talking to other people mostly because they didn't really know what anybody was doing. So it became a very efficient way to address serious problems. Um, and uh, so since that time, that the Elder Care Task Force has grown and expanded. And I think that you can tell whether or not something is going to be successful by whether or not it continues. Uh, I mean, a lot of people s start various initiatives and they might start off kind of hot, but then they fizzle and disappear. The Elder Care Task Force has grown every single year, and the number of elders that we do case management on has grown every year. And really, out of that Elder Care Task Force, because it was an interdisciplinary team, we were able to develop the program that we now have. Next. So within our program, uh, we have social workers, nurses, physicians, psychologists, coder, biller, because the thing has, you know, nothing is going to continue to function if there's no funding. Um, and we didn't start with any specific funding. I just want to talk about this a little bit because you hear it all the time. Well, we don't have any funding. Yeah. Uh, we have resources. There are, there are funds. I mean, our hospitals are open. We're not nailing the doors shut, so there's funding somewhere. So how are you going to use the funds that you have available? We do hire people, so you can make a decision on how you hire people. Well, instead of hiring this discipline, we're going to hire this discipline. And uh, we had the full support of the uh, CEO of the hospital, Dr. Freeland, and the, uh, the executive committee. And so we were able to take positions that hadn't been filled for a period of time, and we moved them to home-based care. And we wrote new position descriptions and etc. So there is a lot of, uh, of flexibility in the system if somebody is willing to take 